Trucker Dump, episode 129. Today's main topic is four ways to become a more efficient trucker. In the feedback section, we're going to hear from Goat Bob, yes, that's his name, <laughs> Driver Dave, Driver Chris Mack, and Dan on subjects running from trucking podcasts to axle weights to cancer to beef liver and finally being pissed off at truckers. But before we do that, we're going to talk about some trucking apps. I've got a crap load of stories to cover this time from new ways to tackle truck parking, new proposed trucking legislation, ELDs, a lost trucker, and a few things that really surprise me about driver pay. This episode of Trucker Dump is sponsored by Citadel Fleet Safety at citadelfleet.com. And a new sponsor, Classic Truck Insurance. Check them out at classictruckinsurance.com slash truckerdump. Welcome to Trucker Dump, where you'll get one driver's insights and sometimes humorous views of truck driving and the trucking industry, and pretty much anything else he feels like dumping on you. This podcast is brought to you by AboutTruckDriving.com, resources to help you understand the world of truck driving through the use of stories and a pathetic attempt at humor. Hey there, Trucker Dumpers. How's it going since the last time we met? For those of you new to the show, my name is Todd McCann. I'm a 20-year trucker. I'm an author of two trucking ebooks, and little known fact, I figured out that I was not a dog person the day my dog got stolen, and I didn't care. <laughs> I had a dog named Mika. She was a Siberian Husky. I don't even remember where I got her, but I had her for, I don't know, a few months, and she was just staying outside in the pen all the time. I wasn't really paying that much attention to her. And one night, somebody stole her. Like I said, I just didn't care. I let it go. Someone even told me who they thought did it, and I still didn't care. <laughs> so, I'm a cat person. What can I say? I know. I just lost about half my listeners. That's all right. <laughs> anyway, those books. What about those books? Hey, Trucking Life is the first one. It's got a 9.25 hour audio book that goes along with it that comes free with the paid ebook version. You can get that on Amazon.com or anywhere else you get your books, your ebooks. And the other one is called How to Find a Great Truck Driving Job. And that is designed for people who are new to the industry and who don't know all the terminology and don't know the right questions to ask. Okay, that's enough pimping. Well, at least for a few minutes anyway. <laughs> First off, I'd like to congratulate the people over at Make-A-Wish Truck Convoy for what seems like a successful event this year on Mother's Day. Uh, they had over 500 trucks at best estimate. Last year they raised uh, $453,000 for the Make-A-Wish Foundation in uh, Pennsylvania. So that was pretty darn cool their goal this year was 500,000 they don't have the numbers in quite yet but let's hope they got close to that looks like like i said there was about 500 trucks in it a little over and there was about 5,000 people in in total so congratulations to ben uh, on that fine event and if you're interested in being a part of that next year go back to the last episode and listen to that that's where we covered it so hey you're ready for it you know what's coming right around the corner right June 5th through June 7th, International Road Check, the big blitz that goes on every summer. They always crack down on one specific thing. I think last year it was brakes they were really looking at. Uh, and this year they're focusing on hours of service, which shouldn't surprise anyone, considering that electronic logging uh, devices were supposed to be mandatory as of December 18th. You know, you shouldn't be worried about this inspection too much this year, if you've got one of these installed in your truck already, and let's face it, you should have already had one by December 18th. So I'm not going to panic about it. Of course, I never panic about these things because like I think I've mentioned on the show before, I don't really ever see that much of a big change. I don't see long lines at way stations or anything like that. And I'm certainly never harassed worse. Uh, maybe that's because my company has been on well, this year, you know, it's e-logs, and my company's been on e-logs since 2010. So that's not going to be a huge issue for sure. But we also have a good safety record, so I just think we're probably not harassed as uh, other smaller companies, especially owner-operators. And I imagine with this ELD thing going into effect, they're really going to be focusing on the um, small-time owner-operators. Good luck out there, guys. <laughs> really. <laughs> Seriously. Have fun. Well, I told you we'd get back to pimping. That break didn't last long, did it? 
Anyway, a couple cool things happened since we last spoke. Hotshotwarriors.com posted a little blog post called the Top 3 Trucker Podcast. And guess who made it to number one? I actually don't know if they were in any particular order, but I'm claiming number one by God. <laughs> so anyway, check that out. Hotshotwarriors.com. Uh, links in the show notes. The other cool thing that happened was I was asked to be a guest on another podcast called Systematic. This is a podcast hosted on the Electric Shadow Network, ESN.FM. This is hosted by Brett Terpstra. He is a, well, he's a very popular guy in the Mac world, in the Apple community. He makes lots of good apps for uh, people, and he gives a lot of the stuff away free. He's just a really neat guy. Uh, he's a great interviewer. Um, anyway, the basis of the show, according to him, is it explores the idea that all work is creative work. Now, since Brett is popular in the Mac community, naturally, I hear him a lot on the Mac podcast that I listen to. So I was already familiar with him and I followed him on Twitter. And one day he said something about uh, getting a weird email from some spammer. And I commented back to him and he commented back to me and realized I was a trucker. He had an uncle who used to be a trucker and he really had been wanting to talk to a trucker. And when he found out this trucker was a podcaster, he thought, perfect. I don't have to train a trucker to be a podcaster. So we had a nice long conversation. Uh, I have to tell you, I was a bit nervous about it. I thought he had a decent following. I was thinking maybe around, you know, 5,000 listeners, something like that. The He's got 30,000 listeners, and he told me this right before we started recording, so I was a little nervous at first, I admit. I think I overcame it pretty quick, thanks to Brett. He's a, such a natural guy and a natural interviewer that it was just really easy to fall into a uh, quick conversation with him. Uh, we just had a pretty good time recording that, and I'd love it if you'd go over there, link in the show notes, and uh, check it out and see how I represented the trucking industry, because most of his... Listeners are tech savvy people. Uh, a lot of them, are, of course, are Mac, you know, Mac loving people. Uh, but he just covers lots of different kinds of topics over there, and none of them that I know of are probably truckers. I'm sure he's got a couple, but uh, anyway, most of them were non truckers. So I had an opportunity to talk to a bunch of non truckers, which is very rare for me. So I hope I did a good job. I'd love it if you go listen to it again. That's the Systematic Podcast with Brett Terpstra. That's Hosted at uh, the Electric Shadow Network, that's ESN.FM. There will be a link in the show notes to that. But you know what is even weirder? This, you know, every once in a while coincidences happen, but this was just too weird. The day after this episode with Brett aired, I was in Minnesota at the time, and he lives in Minnesota. And I got my pre plan information, and I looked at it, and I had to go pick up in, in Wisconsin, and I thought, huh. I think I'm going to be right running right through his hometown. And sure enough, I was. So I contacted him on Twitter and see if he was a free for lunch and uh, bought him lunch. We went down to a nice little place called the Boat House right on the river. Had a nice chat. Uh, really nice guy. Talked about some cool stuff. It was just really weird, you know, for him to be able to, uh, you know, for me to be able to meet with him the day after the podcast aired. Totally bizarre. So anyway, I'd like to thank Brett for having me on the show. That was awesome. And, you know, I wondered if I was going to be able to even reach out to anybody. I really honestly, when I got on the show, I thought, you know, I'm not going to pull anybody over to the Trucker Dump podcast. His listeners are not going to come over and listen to a trucking podcast that they have no interest in. Um, but I still looked at it as an opportunity to, you know, just speak to non-truckers and kind of let them know what we're all about and some of the ways they can drive safer around us and stuff like that. But, you know, I actually did get an email from I got actually a couple of Twitter messages from people who enjoyed the podcast and I got an email from Helga. She says, hi there. I'm a regular listener of Systematic and was quite surprised to hear about truck driving on it. Well, Helga, I was too. I was shocked to be on there in the first place. But she says, not because I didn't think the subject matter belongs there, but because the very same day I received a job offer from one of the biggest truck producers in Europe. I didn't know much about trucks or truck driving, but as my job will be making software that will be used in trucks and for truck drivers, I thought your book would be a perfect introduction to the life of the people that my software will serve. 
I promptly fired up my Kindle and got the book, and I'm currently in the middle of it and enjoying it a lot. Well, that's awesome. I never thought in a million years that I would have a computer programmer from Europe reading my book. But thank you, Helga. I just really appreciate it. So I at least reached I at least reached a couple of people. Uh, so let's hope I get more opportunities like that. It would be really awesome. And how cool is that? Two coincidences like that right in a row. All right. Now, to finish up this pimp session, I have an announcement to make. Um, last podcast, I mentioned the Trucker Dump merchandise was available now, the T-shirts and mugs and all that junk, over at tpublic.com. That is still available there, by the way. But there has been something that was brought to my attention that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, listener Shannon, who is Shannon in the Trucker Dump Slack group, was the first one to order one and the first one to get it. And when he got it, it was a little bit smaller than he expected. So I ordered one, and mine was actually it was just about the right size, but I knew once I washed it it would shrink a little bit and that's kind of the way Shannon felt that it, he was he could wear it now but if he washed it it was going to shrink and I did wash mine and for testing purposes I dried it on high heat for about 60 minutes and it did shrink not a lot but it did shrink some I would also like to add that Pat Smith from the UK ordered one and he said his fit perfectly so I don't know if it's everyone but uh, at least mine and Shannon's seem to be a little on the small side, so my suggestion would be to order one size larger than you normally would, uh, unless you just like them a tad bit snug, which I kind of do, actually. And the reason I tell you this is because this is the thing I discovered that I don't like about Tee Public, but I really have not figured out a way around it. Because these are specially made shirts... And it's such a small audience who might be interested in a Trucker Dump podcast shirt, they will not take returns. So, now, if something is wrong with the shirt, if it's stitched wrong, or if the decal is wrong, or, you know, crooked, or something like that, they will replace it. But if you order the wrong size, they will not let you re, uh, return it, which is uncool. But I have been checking around at all these other places that sell t-shirts and I have not found any other one that would let me I thought I found one there was a place called spread shirt and I thought I had found some uh, a, somebody who would actually let me return the shirts and I actually ordered a couple of them and they were great quality and there was actually more variety of the shirts on that site but it was one of those situations where after a while they said they just rejected my design and I thought, what is going on? And I looked up the fine print. It said that it was too personal in nature, meaning that if they got one back in return, they couldn't resell it. So I can't use them. So I have not figured out a good way around this. So for right now, make sure you order the right size. Uh, they do have a sizing chart on the on the website, so check that out. And uh, just like I say, you can't return them, so make sure you get the right size. Gee, this is going to do great for sales. <laughs> so far, I think I've sold four shirts. Uh, Woohoo! <laughs> but anyway, that's all right. Uh, maybe they'll pick it up eventually. Uh, by the way, I did mention before that T Public has periodic sales, and they do. And when those sales are on, you can pick up a, a T shirt for $14. And I ordered one for the cheapest one, and it's a pretty good quality. I was pretty happy with it. It's just as good as any of my other t-shirts so uh hop on over there and get that link in the show notes get you one of them shirts man or woman yeah we well, have women sizes too okay now enough of the pimping i swear you know there's still a heck of a lot of truckers out here who still have flip phones who don't get with technology and you know, fine if they want to be Luddites, whatever. I'm sure that's not most of you who are listening to this podcast because you at least are tech-savvy enough to go to the website and click a play button, but <laughs> there are some real Luddites out there. But I'm here to tell you that there is a benefit to being a bit tech-savvy in the trucking industry. For instance, I had some recent things happen on Twitter that I was very, very happy about. One was... Well, I just actually saw this one. Somebody had actually tweeted about 
a, a mess. Some trucker had dumped a bunch of stuff out of the back of his truck and just out into the grass by the parking lot. And he was kind of complaining about it. And the thing you can do for those of you who, sorry, for those of you who know what Twitter is all about, but those of you who don't, let me tell you that you can actually kind of flag a person. You can mention a person or a company in the tweet and they will see it. So this person had put the at pilot flying J and that's their handle and they saw it and they immediately got on there and said, Hey, where is this? We want to get over there and clean that up. We want to let the managers know that that happened so we can get it cleaned up. And I thought that's really freaking cool. And this happens a lot. Like if I will just mention that there's a mess somewhere or something, I've had this happen to me too. And just recently I was at a loves and quite honestly, it was the cutest thing. <laughs> I was in there waiting for a shower, of course, because that's what you do at loves. And this little girl and her mom came out of the bathroom and she couldn't have been maybe six years old, something like that. And she was stopping every woman on the way out the door. And she'd go, do not go in that girl's bathroom. It's nasty. <laughs> it was really funny. I mean, she said it to like five people on the way out the door. I just couldn't help myself. So I got on Twitter and I tweeted about it. And I put, you know, the uh, Love's Travels. I think it's Love's Travel Center. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Anyway, Love's Travel something. And they saw it immediately. And they were like, where is this? We want to get this cleaned up. And that's really freaking cool. One other thing I did recently was I was complaining about my international. I know I've talked about this before on the podcast, how my truck does not have an audible warning when it's about to die and it will, it will die after three minutes. You know, just the, uh, it just won't idle for longer than three minutes. There's a little light on the dash, but you can't see it unless you've been way over to, even when you're standing up, you can't see it. It's ridiculous. So anyway, I t tweeted something about, uh, international trucks. I'll name my firstborn child, Pro Star McCann, if you'll fix this and just give me a little warning. And they direct messaged me and said, hey, if you don't mind giving us your contact information, we'd like to talk to you. And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> so I left my phone number in a private message. Nobody else saw it. And it was a couple days later, and someone actually called. And he was trying to figure it out. And, you know, he just wanted to know what my complaint was and all the details of it and why I didn't like the system the way it was. And then he said, well, let me call you back on this. And he called me back in just like an hour or so and said he had looked into it. He looked into the specs and he figured out that there was not a way for that particular warning to make any kind of audible sound, which sucks, quite honestly, because <laughs> I'm stuck with that and I really hate it. But it's great that they reached out to me and just let me know what was going on. And he said they would file a, you know, a little note in with the engineers for the next time they redesign the truck or maybe, you know, the next updates they do to those components or whatever. Maybe they'll uh, include something like that, just a way to make a sound. And, you know, so if you get an engine light of any kind, it will uh, ding at you and you can realize something's happening. So anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. You know, it even happened at Staples one time and they're not even a you know, they're not even a trucking company. Uh, I have this problem at Staples that they often schedule these morning appointments for like nine o'clock, right when the store is opening. And the manager has to be in the back to unlock the door and they have to be in the front to unlock the door. So <laughs> something's got to give. And, uh, you know, I'm standing back there ringing the doorbell, trying to get somebody to come to the dock and they're busy letting their customers in. That's understandable. But I'm like, why do you I just got it on, a, on a tweet and said, Staples, why do you do this? Why do you schedule these appointments for the same time? And I had a back and forth conversation with somebody from Staples and they were trying to get this submitted to the distribution center so they wouldn't schedule it like this anymore. And I just thought that was really cool. So it, it, truckers out there, if you've got a problem with something, you know, if your shower was really crappy or something, or there was a super long wait and, you know, there's sometimes a wait and that's understandable. But if there was a super long one and you just thought it was ridiculous, you can tweet to them, just put their hashtag or not their hashtag, their mention in it, just mention them in the tweet and they'll often respond to you. And uh, don't think it's just because I'm a you know, a podcaster, because nobody knows who I am. None of those people knew who I was. 
Not that I'm aware of. And let's be frank, I'm not anything important anyway. So even if they did, they wouldn't care. All right. Wow, we're 20 minutes in and I have not even got to any of the stories yet. Better get on with this. Hey, you. Yeah, you sitting in the truck going down the road. Have you had a chance to check out the Escort emergency mobile device from Citadel Fleet Safety yet? Well, head on over to citadelfleet.com to learn more. What the Escort is, is a little key fob sized device that's meant for emergencies. It's designed specially for truckers, so it's super tough and it's highly reliable, just like truckers. What's so great about it is you always have it on you. You can wear it on a lanyard around your neck, on a belt clip, or they even have a wrist strap if you want to wear it on your wrist. All you have to do to contact emergency services is hold the little button for three seconds and an emergency advisor from Citadel is going to be on the horn immediately. And since the device has a two-way radio with a GPS in it, you'll be able to do this all hands-free and you won't even have to give your location if you're not able to. But let's hear what a happy customer has to say. Deb is a trucker with Castle Transportation. She says, this device is a real lifesaver, literally. Cost is very reasonable. The device is no bigger than most key fobs, making it easy to wear on the lanyard or in my pocket. The service during testing has also been great. You guys are amazing. Seriously, excellent product that has helped me out on my route two times in the first four months. Thanks, Deb. Now, ideally, you'll never have to use the Escort. But if you do, it's kind of like your mom. Always there for you when you need it. Ultimately, it's peace of mind for you and your family. So what you waiting for? Don't you want a cool device that could save your life and survive a quick dunk in the toilet? Even better, you're not even going to have to pay full price. The Escort is usually $29.95 per month. But because you're a Trucker Dump listener, you get it for $22 per month. And that's not just for the first month. That's as long as you choose to own the device. Now to get that super awesome special deal, all you need to do is go to citadelfleet.com Click on the customer login button in the upper right hand corner, click on the trucker dump logo and use the password trucker dump, all lowercase, all one word. And because your memory probably sucks like mine, I've put the link and the instructions to receive that discount in the show notes. Or if you have more questions about the escort, give them a call at 800-269-5905. That's 800-269-5905. Thanks to Citadel Fleet Safety for sponsoring this episode of Trucker Dump. All right, let's get on with all these stories that I pulled from the news. Hey, our first story, I think I actually heard about this on OverdriveOnline.com, but quite frankly, it could have been anywhere because this has been everywhere. Uh, we were just talking about apps and the Twitter app. Well, this is kind of about apps, too. You've probably all heard of 120. That's O N E 20. That's an app. Uh, well, they've had different kind of apps. They've they ha they have an ELD. They have uh, 120 Maps, an app called 120 Maps that lots of truckers used, and those are all going out of business. Well, I don't guess 120 Properties is actually going out of business itself. It's got bought out by another company called truck that holdings it's i'm not good at business so i'm not going to try to get into all that but anyway basically what it means to the driver is you you have lost your 120 maps app and you've and if you're on the 120 elds right now you're going to have to find a new solution really freaking fast because it's going to shut down its operation on june 18th so get on that really fast <laughs> At least June 18th is after the road blitz, at least. Thank God for that. Anyway, you know, I have been meaning to do a review on this 120 Maps app for quite a while. Uh, Pack Rat in the Trucker Dump Slack group, Mike is his name, he really likes the app, but I never could get into it because, quite honestly, if I'm going to use a map app, it has to run in the background because I want to play music or I want to be able to switch to another app for something, you know, and uh, and I just couldn't get any any time I had anything in the foreground ahead of the 120 Maps app, I wouldn't get notifications on where to turn or anything like that. And quite frankly, the few times I tried to use it, 
I had problems right off the bat, and that's never really a good sign. It was like telling me to turn at wrong places and stuff like that. So I have never been a fan of the app, so I don't really care if it's gone. Uh, good riddance, but <laughs> I know some of you people were a fan of it. So uh, you have to start looking for a new Maps app. They do say that um, they are going to be releasing a app called Truck That. They say in the next four weeks or so. I don't know when exactly this was written. That was written May 21st. So hopefully by uh, June 21st or so, there'll be a new app, and it says it's going to have some of the features similar to, similar to uh, 120 maps, but not all. Quite frankly, like I said, I thought it was kind of shortcoming anyway, so eh, find some other alternatives, I guess. Hey, now, speaking of ELDs, I found this article called Will This New Bill Exempt You From ELDs? over on the truckersreport.com. Obviously, there'll be a link in the show notes there. This talks about there's a new bill that's going in the U.S. House that's supposed to exempt small carriers and owner-operators from needing to comply with the uh, electronic logging device mandate. I have to be honest with you, I don't get this at all. They're saying it's um, designed for companies with 10 or fewer trucks. I've also read five or fewer trucks, so I'm not sure which one's right on that, but Either way, it doesn't matter. And they say they're trying to do it to help out, you know, small trucking operations, farmers and ranchers. But I don't understand. I I understand the farmers and ranchers thing. I do. But if it's just a small trucking operation, that's 97% of the trucks on the road, isn't it? That's the last stat I heard anyway. So what are they saying? I mean, I don't I don't get why they should have an exemption when everybody else has to be on them. I mean, just because you're an owner operator, I mean, I know before ELDs got into effect, they were always saying, oh, well, the average owner operator can't afford them. Well, they turned out to be cheaper than everybody thought they were going to be. And if you're doing it right, you already have one in your truck, so it can't be a cost issue. So I'm really not understanding what they're trying to gain from this, except for just trying to get ELDs thrown out. And quite honestly, I just think they, I love OIDA, but I think they've lost this battle. They're not going away anytime soon. What we need to address is not the ELDs. We don't need to address the ELDs. There's nothing wrong with the ELDs. All the ELDs are doing is enforcing the hours of service rules. If the hours of service rules had more flexibility in them, then we wouldn't care about the ELDs. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who say, uh, there's a guy in my group named Chris. He goes by the name Gravy. He's over on the Trucker Dump Slack group. He did not want to go to uh, to e-logs, but now that he's on them, he actually wouldn't go back because they're so much more convenient. Um, you know, you don't have to know where you're at all the time and stuff like that. And, you know, don't have to do a bunch of math. Math is hard. <laughs> so I just don't really understand why we're attacking the e-logs when we should be attacking the hours of service. That's what needs to be worked on. Anyway, if anybody can explain to me how this makes sense, letting off small carriers who, quite honestly, are more apt to break the law, let's just be honest there. I mean, you work for a big company. Even back in the paper log days, you were going to get audited pretty often. And, uh, you know, you were less likely to cheat than the hot dogs. So I don't understand. It seems to be taking, they seem to be wanting to not enforce ELDs on the people who honestly need it the most. Explain it to me if I'm wrong about that. Okay, now for this next story. I hope that those of you who have been listening to the podcast for a long time don't think I'm just stealing. I've been saying this about the hours of service needs more flexibility. I've been saying that for a long time, but I just saw this article pop up on truckinginfo.com, link in the show notes. It's called Senators Push FMCSA Chief to Reform Trucker Hours of Service Rule. Okay, I guess what's going on here is about 30 senators wrote a letter to the FMCSA saying that they needed to reform the hours of service to provide needed flexibility for truck drivers. Duh. Okay, well, I'm glad they're on that, you know, finally. And they're including all all kinds of different truck drivers, uh, long-haul drivers, short-haul drivers, agricultural, and livestock, uh, just to name a few. But what they're really trying to say is that 
what we need is just not a one size fits all rule, you know, because like right now we've got a little bit of exemptions for agricultural haulers or livestock haulers or something like that. But they're saying that this industry is so varied that we each kind of need our own set of rules. And I think that makes sense. The way I understand it is over in the, the EU, they're, Rules are a lot more complicated than ours, but because they're more complicated, they actually give you more flexibility. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the way I understand it over there. And I think that's really what we need over here. Of course, this was just this letter was just submitted on May 17th, which means that, you know, this is how all of these rules changes take place. You know, somebody submits something and suggests something and then, you know, thousands of years later, something happens. So <laughs> don't get your hopes up uh, too high that anything go is going to happen. But, you know, at least we do have 30 senators on our side who realize there is a problem. So uh, keep your fingers crossed. Now let's get to this uh, truck parking story next. This is very interesting, but it's wrong in my opinion <laughs> okay. see if you agree with me i found this over on truckersreport.com uh it's called midwest states team up for truck parking uh there is a link in the show notes obviously okay here's the deal there's this thing going in it's a multi-state truck program called the truck parking information and management system here's what's going on illinois Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio, and Wisconsin are all measuring how many parking spaces they have available at any time, and they're updating it to a database that anyone can access. Um, so app makers will be able to access it, you know, so probably people like truck parking and truck driver power will be able to tap into it and get that kind of information. And I'm assuming there will probably be, you know, a website. Yeah, it actually says there will be a website and uh, telematic devices. So it might even be available on your uh, electronic logs, that kind of a thing. And the idea is to let truckers know when trucking spots are actually available, which is great. But here's the problem. This isn't really needed in the Midwest that much. <laughs> I mean, think about these states, Kansas, Kentucky, eh, maybe Kentucky a little bit, you know, Missouri, not a huge problem. You know, Wisconsin, not a huge problem. I, I travel in these states a lot and I can almost always find parking. It's not that big of an issue where they need this, you know, is Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, you know. Get it over there in that Northeast. That's where this is really needed. I mean, I'll take it in the Midwest. Great. You know, maybe if it works great in the Midwest, maybe they will adopt something like that up in the Northeast. I don't know. I thought it was a really cool idea, and I hope it happens. They say they're going to have a soft launch for it in, 2000, in the fall of 2018, so right around the corner. And they expect it to be fully implemented in the summer of 2019. So that's not too far off. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I guess we'll see how it works. Hey, we still got a few more stories here. Hope you haven't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> this one I'm sure you had to have heard about. This was everywhere in the news. Once again, I found this on the truckersreport.com. It's called Driver Goes Missing for Four Days After Putting the Wrong Address in the GPS. Okay. All right. This had a lot of stink around it. Uh, first, this guy is a 20-year-old, 22-year-old driver, so he hasn't been doing it that long, probably. Uh, he was hauling a load of potato chips uh Portland, Oregon, and he got lost. Uh, he took a wrong turn, and when he realized it, he corrected on the GPS and decided to follow that and got stuck, and he ended up walking for four, well, about three days, I guess, uh, to get out to I-84, where somebody actually eventually found him. And, of course, people made a big deal out of the fact that he was hauling potato chips and he didn't break into the truck to take any of them for food or anything like that. People were slamming this kid for, like, well, how stupid do you have to be? You know, uh, if you got stuff there, who cares? It's a few bag of chips. You know, at least you wouldn't starve to death. Well, I don't know the situation. I'm sure maybe he probably didn't think he was as far off a route as he was. Maybe he would have taken him. All of this is really beside the point. The point here is that he's following a GPS, probably without any map in his truck to look and see where he's going. 
And that is just a bad idea. You know, I told you about it in a podcast a long time ago. Uh, it was one about giving directions, I think it was, the do's and don'ts of giving directions. I'll have a link to the show notes in that one if I can remember to put it in there. Uh, anyway, you know, that I talked to this trainer and he had a student that refused to learn how to read a map because he said he was going to have a GPS when he got out. And I just don't understand this. I mean, these newfangled kids and everything, <laughs> I guess they just are going to trust technology. I do not. Uh, I just do not trust it. I don't even use a truck specific routing app. What I do is I just look at Google Maps, which I know is not truck friendly. So that's why I always compare. It gives me the best three options usually on which way to go. And then I'll look on my map and see which way is the smart way for me to go. You know, another thing is I don't know how this kid got so lost. Because if you're anything like me, as soon as you make that wrong turn, just a couple of miles down the road, you're starting to get that feeling in your gut like something's not right here. This this is not right. And I would think that would even be more evident when you're in Oregon, you know, kind of out in the boonies. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know how he got lost. Anyway, I'm glad he's safe and everything. But this is just a lesson. Just don't trust your GPS blindly because, well, you probably won't be lucky enough to be hauling potato chips. You'll be hauling scrap metal so you won't have anything to eat to keep you alive. And next up, I wanted to tell you about a little uh, blog post that went up live on AboutTruckDriving.com just a couple of days ago. Uh, this is a really neat uh, resource. It's from Vierden. I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong. Vierdine, Vierdine Tarps. V-E-R-D-U-Y-N. <sighs> Sorry about that. Larry LaBelle wrote up this little uh, blog post, and it is Maximum commercial trailer length state by state. It's an infographic thing. And I have to be honest with you, I learned some things. I did not know. I've been driving for 20 years and I did not know that you could have a 57 foot trailer in Alabama. Didn't know that. Didn't know one was allowed in Arizona either. Uh, but it also has, you know, all the little uh, notes about it. Like, uh, you can have, a, like in Connecticut, you're allowed 53-foot trailer, but if you're on a non-designated state routes, you can only have a 48-foot trailer. So all this is pretty handy if you're running out of your area and don't know what states allow what. So, like, uh, man, I would probably be in, I'd probably be in illegal in Connecticut before and not realized it. <laughs> I guess I better start checking this uh, a little bit more often. Anyway, there'll be a link in the show notes to this. Uh, it's a typical WordPress URL, and it's kind of long. So just run over there and check that out, or go to backtruckdriving.com, and you'll see it as one of the options. And thanks to Larry and Veerduine Tarps. How, how do you like that? Boy, isn't that the fun of this podcast, is listening to me pr mispronounce stuff? <laughs> I guess I should have figured this out beforehand, but oh well, it is what it is. If you want to make all things better, you can just go to their website. That's V-E-R-D-U-Y-N tarps dot com. See? All better. Well, hey, we still got three stories, but guess what? They're all about driver pay, so that ought to make you happy, right? This first one I found on overdriveonline.com. Uh, link in the show notes. It's called ComData institutes instant pay feature for ComCheck mobile app. You know, we've all experienced this thing where you're trying to get money for whatever reason, for a toll or to pay a lumper or something like this. And what a pain in the butt the ComData check is. You know, how you have to call into the company. They have to approve it. They have to send you to another department. They have, you have to call them. They have to ask you information like what's your load number, what's your social security number, all this stuff to get this, you know, authorized. And then they give you like this 657 number confirmation number you got to write down on your <laughs> com check. And it's just a pain in the butt. Well, ComCheck mobile app is supposed to fix that. It's going to be tied to like a debit card. So, and then you also have an iOS or an Android app. So it all ties together. So I guess the way it'll work is when you need money, you'll be able to request it through the app and then your company will approve it. And then you'll just go to an ATM or you can pay just like with a debit card. 
How cool is that? That would be really cool. It'd be even more cool if you could just pay on your phone for through like a barcode or something. I don't know if they're planning on doing that, but that would be really cool. Anyway, I hope my company implements this pretty quick. They've been using some of the new modern apps, and I hope they keep that up. That would be awesome. If they do, I'll let you know how it goes. If you get it first, please let me know how it goes. Okay, now this next story, next to the last story I might add, uh, is actually a poll that I saw over on OverdriveOnline.com. And this is the one I was talking about that really surprised me. The question is asking, what's been your preferred method of primary compensation through the years? Now, personally, well, I didn't write this, but if I would have, I would have asked people what way they would like to be paid because this implies that you have been paid that way. And how do you know if you like a way if you've never been paid that way? But I, I guess I kind of see what they're going for here. But anyway, like I said, this surprised me. There's five main ways to get paid. Okay, there's, of course, the ever common pay per mile. There's hourly pay. There's percentage of the load. There's weekly, monthly, or annual uh, guaranteed pay, like a salary. And then there's a per load flat rate. Well, I expected the salary to come in way higher. I expected it to come in first, but I was completely wrong. The top one was percentage of the load, which. Like I say, I've never done that, so maybe that's great. According to these people who have taken this poll, apparently it is great. They got 40.69% of the vote. Uh, Paper Mile, that's, this one shocked me. Paper Mile got 2045 So it was actually second place. And I really thought everybody was kind of against this Paper Mile. I mean, it, it's great if the company is going to give you a bunch of miles. But you are limited by how much you can do with the 70-hour rule and by how often they give you loads. You know, if they leave you sitting for 20 hours, you aren't making any money. So, quite honestly, I thought hourly pay would come in above pay per mile. Uh, But it didn't. Hourly pay was third, coming in at 19%. So, the weekly, monthly, or annual guaranteed pay came all the way down at 7%. And that just shocks me because... I don't understand it. Like, you know, if I was making, say, 60000 a year, you know, on pay per mile, there's an uncertainty with that. I don't know. Maybe the next year I'll make sixty five. Maybe the next year is bad and I'll make fifty five. Who knows? But if they just told me, just guaranteed me and said, hey, we're going to pay you 60000 a year as long as you're out this many days or something like that. Or they, you know, give you, uh, you know, say five days or five days out on the road and a home for the weekend or something like that, whatever, as long as you know what the terms are, that seems like to me to be such a no brainer that everyone would want to do this because you have guaranteed pay there. There wouldn't be any more of these weeks where you have this awesome paycheck, you know, two weeks in a row. And then your third paycheck sucks, you know, and you're bringing home two or 300 bucks and you know because you didn't have any any loads and of course that's the very week that the mortgages do of course (laughs) so i just don't understand why people wouldn't want in a salary and if you can explain that to me please do i would love it um if anybody's on salary i'd also like to talk to you that'd be pretty cool I'd like to know what that's like. I've never experienced that steady, secure feeling that you have. <laughs> Every week is up in the air for me. All right, now this final story should make you very happy. It's from the truckersreport.com. Survey says driver pay is going up. Okay. According to this driver compensation study, which was conducted and published by the American Trucking Association, or ATA, they surveyed 97,000 company drivers and over 7,000 independent contractors. Uh, What they found was that in the past few years, trucker pay has been raising about 50% faster than pay for the average worker. How do you like that for a change of pace? (laughs) We've been stuck in a rut for so long. Anyway, the last study was done in uh, 2013. And they said the average increase has been 15% for the uh, average company driver, up to 53000 And during that same period, independent contractors got about an 18% increase to over $86,000. That's 
pretty darn cool. I don't know if the rest of you have noticed this. I know I got a big raise in 2013, so that would uh, probably right after that last study. So that would make sense. I have been noticing a lot of companies out there that are now starting to pay close to 50 cents a mile or more. And man, it's about freaking time, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it seems like driver pay has been so static for so many years and thank god they're finally realizing our worth of course what it really is is they just can't keep drivers so they have to <laughs> raise their pay hey great for us i've been thinking this was going to happen for years but it it just took for years you know <laughs> oh well uh, I'm just glad to see it happen, and I hope uh, you will start looking around at some other companies. Uh, if you're stuck at some job that's paying you, you know, 38 cents a mile, uh, get out there and start looking. There's companies that will start you way more than that. So get on it, man. Hey, you know what? I lied about that being the last story. <laughs> You know, I got so many links here in my list that I just completely overlooked it, but I cannot pass on this one. This has to be like the stupid story of the of the episode. I just don't get this one. Okay, I found this on OliverDriveOnline.com. Link in the show notes. This happened in 2014. There was a crash involving Warner Enterprises and a car. In the crash, there was a 7-year-old who was killed and a 12-year-old that was paralyzed. Sad, right? Okay. Understood. Um, the title of the article is Warner Will Appeal $90 Million Verdict in Crash Lawsuit. Okay, well, maybe Warner deserves to pay $90 million for causing an accident, right? Thing is, they didn't cause the accident. Okay, here's the way this works. There was really poor weather conditions. There was freezing rain. Uh, there was limited visibility and black ice. And what happened was a car was out on the road. They lost control of their vehicle, went across the median of a freeway, crashed into Werner, who was in their lane going below the speed limit. And somehow Werner has to pay $90 million for this. Now I have to think that this ruling is going to be overturned in this appeal. There's just no way. Uh, this has to be a decision made by a bunch of jurors who were just going on emotions. Yes, it's sad that the kid was killed. Yes, it's sad that the other one was paralyzed. But this trucker was doing nothing wrong. Now, the attorney for the car said that the Warner driver shouldn't have been on the road because the road conditions were poor. Okay, fine, fair. But doesn't that also mean that the auto driver shouldn't have been on the road? <laughs> I mean, they're both going down the road in bad conditions. Only one of them lost control, and that was the car. So I'm not sure how this falls on Warner. And actually, it actually did. I'd like to point that out, that it did fall on Warner and not the driver. So thank God for that, because the driver probably wouldn't have been able to afford to defend himself. But Warner can. And, uh, you know, there's what the attorney is saying is that Warner should have told them to get off the road. They should have not allowed them to be on the road in the first place. But, you know, that isn't the way most of the trucking industry works. You know, most of the carriers out there let the driver make the decision on whether it's safe or not. Now, I have to think that in if it was me in that position... I probably couldn't have gotten nailed for anything because, well, one, I wouldn't have been on the road because my company, as far as I know, is the only one out there. It's probably not, but it's the only one I know of that doesn't uh, or that shuts us down in bad weather. Um, and, you know, they tell us when we can move again, and they do that all by weather channel and stuff like that. Uh, so I wouldn't have been out on the road in the first place. Probably that would have shut us down in the black ice conditions. But, like I say, that isn't the way most trucking companies work. So, anyway, this is just really screwy. I just have to think this is going to be overturned, and I hope it does, because can you imagine what kind of precedent this sets? You know, that if a vehicle crosses the road, even a median of a highway, hits a car, all of a sudden it's the truck's fault if for some reason they weren't supposed to be there, or if there is even slightly poor uh, weather conditions, you know, fog or something like that, they'll start blaming it on the truck. And, boy, that's going to open up a whole can of worms. I hope 
it doesn't go down that path because at that point it's just not safe for any of us drivers to even be driving these stupid trucks anyway that was a long story but (laughs) i thought it should be shared because it's redonkulous all right well like i said that was a weird episode so far we got a lot mostly stories and i just don't normally do that but there was a lot of interesting news to cover so hope you guys don't mind that uh let's get on with some regularly scheduled things here give us a bottle of your finest champagne five shrimp cocktails and some bread for my brother what's that sushi sushi boy some chicken wings have really hit the spot (laughs) this is a tasty burger don't play with your food eat it You know, it's kind of sad that I spent probably about an hour and a half putting that little clip you just heard together. (laughs) And all for nothing, because I'm probably going to drop the trucker grub section. It's just not been as popular as I thought it might be. I thought drivers would really want to share their awesome places that they've eaten. But I guess that's not the case. And quite honestly, that's okay. I never expected everything I did on this podcast would work. And, uh... This clearly does not. I just haven't gotten the feedback I expected, but that's okay. Anyway, I'd like to thank driver Chris Mack and trucker Bob for submitting uh, the segments that we did have, and uh, trucker Bob's going to bring you the last one. That is, unless I hear from a whole bunch of you that you do not want this segment to go away, although I doubt that's going to happen because I've never got a whole bunch of you to do anything. (laughs) Anyway, Bob, take it away. Greetings, Trucker Dumpers. Trucker Bob here with another Trucker Grub review. I like a good beef or bison steak or hamburger. Bison meatloaf, fresh cut fries, homemade blue cheese dressing, wedge salad, or a fresh carved turkey with all the trimmings for a change of pace. Now you may be asking yourself, I too would like to step up my Trucker Grub game. Where, pray tell, can I get some chow like that? Certainly not in a truck stop, but you can get it at Ted's Montana Grill. Ted Turner, yes, that Ted, who founded CNN and Turner Classic Movies, has a huge ranch in Montana where he grows all the beef and bison for his chain of restaurants. While most of the Ted's Montana grills are a no-go for truck parking, I know of one location where you can park your rig and walk just a couple hundred feet to get to one. It's in northwest Indianapolis at 6010 West 86th Street. Off of Interstate 465, take the West 86th Street exit and head east a few hundred yards to Zionsville Road and turn left. Go north on Zionsville Road another couple hundred yards and then turn left on FFA Road behind a strip mall. There will be a Michael's Crafts and a PetSmart store on your left and an AMC movie theater on your right. Park in back of the PetSmart. On your left will be a city bus stop. Walk towards it, and then Ted's will be on your right. You don't need to dress fancy, but don't look like a bum either. Jeans and a collared shirt are okay. Use GPS and tedsmontanagrill.com to get the exact location and the lowdown on the menu. Don't forget to ask for the complimentary plate of pickles, which are homemade. Eat well, treat yourself every once in a while, and bon appetit. Trucker Bob out. And now, let's have a moment of silence for the death of Trucker Grub. Ah, screw that. Let's get on with it. I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, Classic Truck Insurance, that can be found at ClassicTruckInsurance.com slash TruckerDump. All right, so what's the dealio with Classic Truck Insurance? Well, if you visit their website, you'll see that they call themselves the one-stop shop for transportation services, and I think that pretty much sums it up. End of ad. Okay, not really. (laughs) So what is so great about these guys? Well, for one thing, they're an independent insurance agency, and you know how much I love that. Only an independent agent can shop around for the best prices. Another great thing, they've been in business for 30 freaking years. That's like way older than some of you drivers out there. And all that experience means that they can help you walk through all the confusing aspects of truck insurance. That way you're not buying more or less than you actually need. It's just right, just like Goldilocks. One thing they offer that a lot of providers don't is short-term truck insurance. Now you need this whenever you, say, buy a new truck and you just need to move it from one location to another. You don't need an entire policy for that. You just need short-term truck insurance. They've got it. 
Another thing they can do is help you get your own authority. So if you're a company driver who wants to get into owner-operating, or you're a lease driver who just wants to move up the food chain a bit, call Classic Truck Insurance and let them help you get your own authority. But you know what? They are the one-stop shop for transportation services, so they offer even more. Ever thought about becoming a broker? Or maybe you've got a spouse at home that takes care of all the business aspects of your truck while you drive it? Maybe they want to become a broker and bring in even more money for your company. Classic Truck Insurance can totally hook you up. How about customer service? Well, no worries there. They specialize in small fleets and owner-operators and really want to get to know you so they can provide you the best experience possible. Classic Truck Insurance really is your one-stop shop for transportation services. They're based in Knoxville, Tennessee, but they can sell you insurance in all the lower 48 states. So why don't you give them a call at 888-498-0255 or visit ClassicTruckInsurance.com slash TruckerDump. Thanks to Classic Truck Insurance for sponsoring this episode of Trucker Dump. Hey, Trucker Bob just did our last segment of Trucker Grub, and I wanted to give a shout out to him. He actually has been driving for a dang long time. He's been driving for 25 years. I think all of that was at J.B. Hunt. He's got over 2 million safe miles on the road, and he recently retired. A little bit early. He's 59, uh, but health issues made him uh, get out of the trucking industry. Well, it didn't force him out. It was just a better decision when he looked at all the options. So uh, he is no longer a trucker, but I have to say he really got a good send-off with J.B. Hunt. I mean, they had the marching band, the high school marching band out and everything. They had some banquets for him and some other drivers who had reached 2 million safe miles. And it was just really cool to see that whole process of somebody uh, you know, going through the emotions of quitting uh, a job that they've lived their life for, basically. And it was just really neat to experience that. And uh, I just have to say that I owe Bob a debt of gratitude because he was the one who brought the idea for the iTruckers Slack group. That's the group where, if you like Mac stuff, Apple stuff, iPhones, uh, and you're a trucker, join that group iTruckers at iCloud.com. Uh, but he was the one who came up with that, and then that made me think about starting a Trucker Dump Slack group. And I have to tell you, I get so much joy out of that group. Uh, you know, it's such a tight group of guys over there. It's mostly guys. I think we got maybe one woman, Renee, but she's not in there much anymore. I don't know. Maybe it was too much of a guy's place. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's just a really neat bunch of guys. We have all kinds of neat conversations. We kid around a lot. And I just never had that many friends when I was a trucker out here by myself before that Slack group came along. You know, I had some people that I knew on Twitter and stuff like that, but it's really, Twitter isn't really that back and forth type of a uh, medium like like Slack is. So if you're interested in joining that group, that's truckerdump at gmail.com. Just ask for an invite. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. There always is at the end of the show notes uh, to click on that and uh, get the email opened up. Join up. Or join the Facebook group if you're a Facebook person. Just look up Trucker Dump Podcast over there. So anyway, I just wanted to give Trucker Bob a shout out and tell him thanks for all his years of service out here on the road. I appreciate it, and I'm sure most of you, uh, most everybody who eats does. <laughs> thanks, Bob. Holy bamoly macaroni. <laughs> wow. We're an hour in and we have not even got to the main topic yet. All right. Well, let's just get on with it then. I called this one Four Ways to Become a More Efficient Trucker. And who doesn't want that? Experienced truckers know that there are many things in the trucking industry that are out of your control. If you're a newbie who hadn't figured this out yet, you soon will. But this doesn't mean that everything is out of your control either. Here are some ways you can become a more efficient trucker. Efficient trucker tip number one, always ask about early delivery or a drop. This is a huge mistake I see too many truckers making. Drivers often assume that just because their company is forced dispatch that they have to take whatever load's given to them. This is simply wrong. Forced dispatch only means that you have to take the load if you can't supply a good reason not to. 
So if you want to become a more efficient trucker, you need to start thinking differently. Never accept the status quo. Every time I get a new dispatch, the first thing I do is look to see when the load picks up and delivers. Now, ideally, you've got just enough time to drive the empty miles to pick up the load and get to its delivery on time, but not arrive there too early. If that's the case, great. Accept the load, drive safe, and stay out of my way. But all too often, when they're asking you to drive 50 miles to pick up a load, it doesn't pick up for five hours, meaning you're going to get there about four hours early. And then when you look at the delivery time, you figure you're going to be there a whopping 10 hours earlier than your appointment time. Now what? If you've got the customer's phone number, use it. But as you well know, many of us company drivers don't have access to it. I get it. They don't want us calling and harassing them. I do get it. But hey, if that's the case, contact your dispatcher. Now sure, you could use the extra time on these loads to stop in some quaint town along the way and go sightseeing. Or you could use the time to polish your chrome or head into the casino for some blackjack. But this article is about being a more efficient trucker. None of these things are efficient. In fact, they're all going to cost you time and money. Now, I don't keep stats on this sort of thing, but if I had to guess, I'd say I'm calling or messaging my dispatcher on about half my loads, possibly more. Whichever wait time, either the pickup or delivery, is the longest, that's what I'm asking about first. Hey, Gina, that's my dispatcher. I can be at the shipper at 1 p.m., but the load doesn't show to pick up until 5 p.m. Will they load me early? Now, sometimes it's a set appointment and there's nothing you can do about it. Other times, they'll have notes about the customer saying that you can pick up any time and that the time listed is just a suggested appointment time. Now, honestly, that doesn't seem very efficient to me, but unfortunately, I can't change their company policies. Other times, I'll notice the pickup time is something crazy like 24 hours away, even though I'm only 80 miles out. Again, I'm immediately asking what the deal is. Maybe freight's just slow in the area, so your options are limited. But it's also a good possibility that someone in the office screwed up and thought you didn't have any driving hours available, or they just looked at the shipping date wrong. You might be surprised how often this happens. If you're going to arrive at your delivery extra early, ask if they'll accept the load early. This happened to me again just the other day. The load I was on delivered at 9 p.m., but I could get there about 9 a.m., the comments section for this load specifically said, do not attempt to deliver earlier than appointment time. Now, usually when the load comments are that specific, I know they're set in stone. Therefore, I was resigned to it. But I still put on my efficient trucker hat to figure out how to make the best use of my time. Now, I was low on hours that day, so my plan was to come off a 10-hour break and drive the remaining three hours to get as close to the delivery location as I could. I'd then take yet another 10-hour break and then deliver the load at 9 p.m. My thought was that by the time I was unloaded, I'd be getting hours back again at midnight and I'd be ready to roll again. Of course, this sucks for your sleep because I'd just come off a 10-hour break. How I'm expecting myself to sleep again that soon? That's a different issue that we won't have time to go into today. Now, obviously, I didn't really want to do this, so I thought to myself, hmm, what can it hurt to ask about an early delivery? So I did. I've included a screenshot of the messages that I sent to my dispatcher. But since this is an audio thing, I'll read it for you. I said, I am assuming nothing has changed and I still cannot deliver this until 2100. I'm just a couple of miles from delivery. You'll notice my negativity there. <laughs> Dispatch, double checking. About 25 minutes later, I get a message that says, They said to come on in. They should be able to get to you. If not right away, they have an opening at 11 o'clock. Thanks, Gina. Sweet! <laughs> and when I got there, they immediately put me in a dock. So, it never hurts to ask. So you can see, this time it was a happy result. As I always tell my dispatcher, he who does not ask, does not receive. <laughs> you might remember that the next time you're in a similar situation. Now one thing I had forgot to mention was that due to my low hours, I only had two and a half hours left to drive that day after my delivery. Now, I'm sure many drivers would have just accepted this fact and stuck with the original plan. <laughs> Not this super efficient trucker. As you can no doubt already see, I'm very aware of my available hours. I'm even more anal about this the closer it gets to home time. This instance happened about a week before my scheduled home time. Now, I'm sure you've probably been in this scenario before. You're just shy of having enough driving hours to get home without taking another 10-hour break first, or you're waiting around until midnight to get hours back before you can finish the drive home. Either that, or you turn outlaw and drive the few hours home illegally. 
You naughty little pet. But hey, good luck with that now that e-logs are mandatory. Most of them won't shut your truck down, but you're going to get flagged. My point is, that two and a half hours extra that I could utilize today might be the two and a half hours that I need to get home this coming weekend. This is yet another reason why it's so important to be as efficient as you can be. Now, if you can't deliver early, ask if you can drop the loaded trailer somewhere else. If your dispatch says the customer won't let you deliver early, ask them if there's somewhere along your route that you can drop the load. For instance, if you have a terminal or a drop yard in route. Now, as the driver, you probably know your route better than the dispatcher, so make a suggestion. Hey, since I can't deliver this early, can I drop at the Columbus or St. Louis yard? I'm going right past both of them on the way to delivery. If they've got other freight in the area that needs to move, they'll usually hook you right up. And yeah, it might suck to turn a 600-mile trip into a puny 350-mile run, but at least you're not going to be sitting outside a customer for 24 hours waiting to get unloaded. You can use that time to be running a different load to make up those lost miles. Trust me here, it usually pays off in the end. Now, probably the reason I make the call to dispatch so often is because it works to my advantage most of the time. If I can point out how the load isn't very efficient, they'll often toss it back into the pile of loads and come out with something better. But other times, I'm just stuck with the load and there's nothing anyone can do about it. That's when you reach into your medicine cabinet, pop a chill pill, and accept it as part of trucking. At least you tried to be the most efficient trucker you can be. Good for you. Now I can hear some of you thinking, my dispatcher ain't going to want to go through all this trouble for me. Well, tough nuggies. That's their job, you know. Besides, dealing with the driver is often the dispatcher's only job at most of these larger carriers. There are usually different groups of people who plan the loads and deal with customer service issues. If you're working for a small carrier, yeah, it's going to eat into their day. But, oh well, like I said, it's their job. Now, in my personal experience, I can tell that my dispatcher does sometimes get annoyed with me questioning these loads so frequently. But that's usually when she's especially busy trying to get drivers home for the weekend or something's going horribly wrong with another driver on their fleet. Remember, part of a dispatcher's performance review is based on how efficient their fleet is. So, it actually benefits them if you ask this question and become a more efficient trucker. You just might have to remind them of this fact until they get used to you asking about getting rid of these loads early. Now, let's say that despite your best effort, you're still stuck with this load and you're going to get to your delivery 10 hours before your appointment time. How can you still be an efficient trucker? Efficient trucker tip number two, sleep at the customer. One reason I'm glad I was on the electronic logging device bandwagon way earlier than most, back in 2012, is because it forced my company to start adding one new bit of information to our load information, whether there is overnight parking at the shipper or receiver. Now this used to be another phone call or message to dispatch, but now the information is right there in the load comments. Thank God, because this makes me a much more efficient trucker. How so? Well, unless I'm 100% positive that my load is a drop and hook trailer, I will always try to sleep with the customer overnight if it's allowed. Now I know this isn't a popular choice among truckers, but I'm convinced it makes me a more efficient trucker. Even if it is drop and hook, I'll still often sleep there anyway. Why? It saves my 14 hour clock. Now, I've talked to many truckers over the years who simply refuse to sleep at a customer unless it's their only option. The argument is always that they want access to food and bathrooms. Eh, fair enough. But if you want to be the most efficient trucker you can be, you really need to get over this. Sleeping at the customer honestly wasn't as necessary back in the day when we had paper logs. We could often fudge the timeline so that we didn't lose so much driving time. But since the inflexible ELDs have been mandatory since December of last year, sleeping at a customer facility is really the number one way I've found to maximize my 70 hour work week. First off, it's not hard to work around the bathroom and food issue. If at all possible, you should always find out ahead of time what the bathroom situation is. Some of the customers I visit have 24-hour restrooms for drivers. Sometimes it might be a porta potty but it's better than nothing. Even if they don't have restrooms available overnight, simply stop at the nearest truck stop before you get there and take your giant trucker dump. Even if you don't need to, you might ought to pull in and try. Now in the number one department, even us older guys with smaller bladders can get through the night since the vast majority of truckers have some sort of piss bottle in the truck. Eh, it's gross, but don't deny it. 
Even if you don't, you can always go water some of the local shrubbery. Serves the customer right for not keeping the restroom open for you, right? As for access to food, if you're one of those money bags who eats in restaurants all the time, you can check into apps like Yelp or Google Maps to see if there's any little eateries within walking distance. You never know, you might find a gym. Or you can always go the easy route and grab an extra sandwich at the ever-present Subway. Honestly, all drivers should be keeping a little bit of food on hand anyway. Think about the story we had earlier of the driver who got lost for four days. You know, peanut butter and cans of soup have a seemingly endless shelf life. One of the perks of me being such a cheapskate is that I always have food in my truck, so this is never an issue for me. Now when I say sleeping at a customer, that's exactly what I mean. I'm not talking about hanging out there for 24 hours or anything. Although this super efficient trucker has done exactly that many times if that's what it takes to squeeze in a 34 hour break. I remember last year I spent 34 hours behind a PetSmart. <laughs> there was nothing back there, but I could walk around and use the restroom during business hours. But hey, even if you're only going to arrive, say, six hours before you deliver, you should still park on site if you can. Again, we're trying to save your clock here. I see two major benefits in doing this. First is you might get into the dock early. Let's say you arrive at 2 a.m. and your appointment's not till 10 a.m but you see they open at 7 a.m. If you don't mind interrupting your beauty sleep, God knows some of us really need it, <laughs> it never hurts to check in at 7 a.m. to see if you, they'll take you early. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck do I want to get in the dock at 7 a.m. if my 10-hour break isn't over till noon anyway? Well, that's reason number two. Because you never know how long it's going to take to load or unload. If I were to take a poll of truckers on the biggest problems in the trucking industry, I'd be willing to bet that one of the top five answers would be shippers and receivers wasting our driving hours. Not a day goes by when you don't hear some trucker whining about how the shippers and receivers don't value our time. Well, this is one way you can mitigate it. If they want to take six hours to get me unloaded, then at least they're doing it while my electronic log shows me an off-duty or sleeper berth. If it only takes two hours, great! Stay up and get started planning your next load. Or you can always try to go back to bed to finish that sweet dream you were having about Farrah Fawcett. Hubba hubba. Now let's look at you drivers who refuse to sleep at a customer overnight. You have a 10 a.m. appointment, so you wake up full of piss and vinegar, eager to utilize the 11 hours of driving you have available. You start your pre-trip inspection at 9 a.m., roll into the customer at 9.30 a.m., and bump the dock at 10 a.m. I love it when a plan comes together. Uh-huh. You silly little optimistic trucker. In reality, six hours later, you're finally ready to roll. But thanks to the cursed 14-hour rule, you only have seven hours left to drive. Who's to blame, you or the customer? Well, both. But you could have prevented this if you had slept at the customer overnight. So those four hours of driving you lost are ultimately on your head. Remember, we can't control everything, so we have to control the things we can. But hey, let's be realistic. Not every customer takes six hours to unload. Even if it only takes two hours, you've left yourself very little extra time to do anything else except for drive like a madman all day. You can kiss that workout and shower goodbye. Yeah, right. Like truckers exercise and bathe. <laughs> now I know this sleeping at a customer thing is an unpopular choice that many of you will just outright refuse to budge on. So be it. If you want to continue to be an inefficient trucker, that's up to you. I would just suggest that you try it for a while and see if you don't notice that you're making better use of your hours of service. And that usually transfers to better paychecks, right? Oh yeah, and there's one other benefit from sleeping at customer locations. You have less chance of sleeping with your head right next to someone's screaming reefer unit. Unless, of course, you're pulling a reefer, which in that case, you're just screwed. Efficient trucker tip number three keep your ETA PTA updated. But first, we need to make sure you know what the terms ETA and PTA means to your company. Now, most of the carriers I've worked for, ETA means estimated time of arrival, and PTA stands for projected time of availability. But I've also worked for a couple of companies who used ETA as estimated time of availability instead of PTA. Yeah, it was just as confusing then as it is now. Now these two versions of ETA, or ETA and PTA, are vastly different things. 
Now, let me explain. I know most of you truckers already know this, but for the non-truckers, let me explain. My estimated time of arrival might be 9 a.m., but if I know the customer usually takes two hours to unload, that would make my estimated time of availability at 11 a.m., because it's going to take two hours to unload. This could even be worse. Take, for example, our earlier scenario where my estimated time of arrival was 2 a.m. because I was going to get there early. But my appointment was not until 10 a.m. You remember that? Okay, so figure one hour to unload and my estimated time of availability is actually 11 a.m. That's one hour after my 10 a.m. appointment. Now, that's nine hours difference between my ETA, estimated time of arrival, and the other one they call ETA, or the PTA, the estimated time of availability, or projected time of availability. The point is, you want to keep your dispatcher as up-to-date as possible about your available working hours. While it's true that most modern dispatching software will keep track of that, I've never had a dispatcher who didn't appreciate not having to look it up. As an added bonus, I believe that staying on top of your available working hours makes you look a bit more professional than your fellow drivers. Nothing's worse than when they call you up to ask you if you have hours to do a load and you have no clue. Okay, I've got one more suggestion to be the most efficient trucker you can be. Efficient trucker tip number four, don't keep a steady schedule. Okay, I fully accept that with the way your particular circadian rhythm works, some of you simply cannot do what I'm about to ask. But if you can, or if you even think you can, you should try it for a while. We all know those drivers who get up at 7 a.m. and drive their 11 hours. Worst case scenario, the 14-hour clock is up at 9 p.m. They're back up and rolling at 7 a.m. They do this every day. Obviously, the start time can change. Some drivers suggest 3 a.m. to 3 p.m., so you can always find parking at 3 p.m., whatever it is. Anyway, I suppose there's nothing wrong with doing this if you know exactly what your freight is every day and you have complete control over it. More power to you if that's your situation. Personally, I admit, I kind of hate your guts if that's your case. But for the vast majority of over-the-road drivers, we have no idea when or even if we're going to get a load to run on any given day. So by not keeping a steady schedule, you're working as hard and as fast as you can when you have freight so that when those inevitable downtimes come along, they don't hurt nearly as much. Let's do a little math. Well, we all love math, right? To keep things simple, let's assume two things that aren't exactly true unless you've entered the land of fairy dust and unicorn farts. First, that it's possible to run 11 hours straight, take a 10-hour break, and then run your 11 hours again for multiple days in a row. Obviously, you can't do that, but for the sake of math. And secondly, let's assume that we have competing truck drivers. One loosey-goosey driver who likes to run hard, and one steady schedule driver who likes to start his day at midnight. Now, again, this probably isn't very realistic, but the, for the sake of the easy math, you'll see how this goes. Now, here's the case for not driving a steady schedule. Now, in this magical world where everything always runs smoothly, let's say both drivers start the day at midnight and are done driving by 11 a.m. They both take a mandatory 10-hour break. When the break is over, the loosey-goosey driver starts running again at 9 p.m., while the steady scheduled guy is waiting around for midnight to start his day like he does every day. Now you can see that the loosey-goosey driver now has 14 hours of driving already finished in that first 24 hours. That's 11 on the first driving shift and 3 on the second. While the steady scheduled driver only has 11 hours under his belt. Come midnight, the steady scheduled guy runs another 11 hours for 22 hours total over the next two days. But loosey-goosey driver drove from 9 p.m. the night before to 8 a.m. the next morning, took another 10-hour break and started driving again at 6 p.m meaning he now has 28 hours of driving in the same time frame. That's six more hours over two days. Now, I'll spare you the math. You're welcome. But at the end of three days, the loosey-goosey driver has driven nine more hours than the steady driver. Now, I can hear some of you saying, Yeah, but that ain't the way the trucking industry works in the real world. You know what? You're right. There will be days when you don't get a full 11 hours of running. There might even be days when you don't get a run at all. And that's my point. Run it when you got it. Here's my philosophy. When you have freight, run it as hard and as fast as you legally can, utilizing all three previous tips to make the best use of your hours. 
That way, when you do have the inevitable downtime, then at least you've been as efficient as you can possibly be up until that point where things are now out of your control. A side benefit of this is doing a 34-hour break. Oftentimes, these steady drivers don't even run a full 11 hours. Their idea is that if they work 10 hours maximum per day, both driving and on-duty time combined, for 7 days each week, that they will never run out of their 70 working hours. Hmm, okay, well, good theory. That means you'll get a maximum of 70 working hours under perfect conditions. Now let's look at Mr. Lucy Goosey driver who hammers down. Again, I won't bore you with the math, but if this driver runs as soon as possible after each 10 hour break, they can easily hit their 70 hours maximum in 5 days. Now if Lucy Goosey then takes a 34 hour break to restart their 70 hours, they can now expand their available working hours to over 80 hours in the same amount of time that the steady driver has only worked 70 hours. That could add up to about 10% more money. To sum up, my belief is that to be the most efficient trucker you can be, you need to work as hard as you can while you have loads to run so you can maximize your potential. Every hour of your available 70 counts in trucking, so be conscious of every single one of them. If a customer will take a load as soon as you can get it there, don't screw around. Deliver it ASAP. You could have mechanical problems that cause delay. You could be delayed by a lazy loader. You could hit a patch of bad weather. If you've dilly-dallied when you could have been running hard, you may even find yourself delivering late if something unexpected happens. I always run as hard as I can to get where I'm going, even if I can't deliver early. I honestly can't count how many times I've been able to rescue a load from another driver who's low on hours while he sits under my load to get those hours back. You know, that's a win-win-win situation. The company is getting their rescued load delivered on time. The other driver is in no rush now, so he's getting back hours while he's sitting under your load. And best of all, I'm making more miles. So my advice is to step out of your comfort zone and try some of these tips. Don't automatically accept loads that don't make good use of your time. Argue your point with a cool head. Don't be pissy about it. Nobody likes that. And if nothing can be done about the delivery time, ask if you can drop the load someplace to keep moving. Try sleeping at the customer to maximize your driving hours. You'll be surprised how less stressed you'll be when that slow forklift dude isn't eating into your driving hours. And try to get off your steady schedule and run hard when you have freight. Save your loafing time for those times when you're stuck without a load. And if you can do a 70-hour reset, do it. And lastly, keep your ETA and your PTA updated so your dispatcher can find your next good load that maximizes your earning potential. And if that load sucks, get on the phone and start the whole process over again. Man, ain't trucking fun. Yo, bud, where do you want this load of feedback? I'm going to got some feedback for you. First one is from Goat Bob. How he got a name like Goat Bob, I have no idea. Not sure I want to know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Goat Bob, write in and tell me how you got that name. He writes, greetings, Todd. I recently found your podcast via the Talk CDL podcast. Johnny Acid is funny and informative as you are. Stay true, blessed, and safe. Oh, man. Johnny is a mess over there. <laughs> you know, Troy and Johnny, they have a lot of fun on that podcast. I am a listener of Talk CDL Podcast, as you should be. Uh, support your local trucking podcasters. Um, you know, one time I was listening to the show over there, and they were talking about other trucking podcasts. And I was just waiting for it, you know. <laughs> I was just waiting to hear what was happening. And Troy was being his normal, you know, pretty nice self. Uh, uh, you know, he was trying to be as friendly as he could about the topic. Uh, Johnny is never that way. He's always very bold and uh, says exactly what he thinks. And, of course, he said, all other trucking podcasts suck. <laughs> Those were his exact words. And I thought, oh, man, they don't. They either they haven't heard my podcast or they heard it and they suck. But, thankfully, he added the glowing review right afterwards that said, well, I guess the Truckered Up podcast doesn't totally suck. <laughs> and, hey, he singled me out as not totally sucking, so I'll take that. Anyway, I uh, love that show. Uh, I listen to it. Uh, like, like I've mentioned before, I am a bit envious of them being able to bounce off each other like that. I wish I could 
set up something with somebody else, and uh, I think it'd be a, probably a better show for you guys. But it is what it is. Anyway, thanks for writing in, Goat Bob. Man, I don't know how I can say that with a straight face. <laughs> David wrote in. Actually, David wrote in a few times. Um, Driver Dave, and I'm going to get to one of them today because he always writes long emails and he always warns me that they're coming, but I love him, so it's great. He writes, Greeting, Todd. Okay, I haven't written in a while. He says, This might be a long one. See, told you, he warns me. (laughs) He says, I like your emphasis on podcasting. Ah, he's talking about my podcast, Why podcasts are the best medium for truckers there'll be a link in the show notes to that it was episode 127 i think 128 128 i think oh anyway link in the show notes he just says i would like to re-emphasize it podcasts are the cutting edge broadcast medium of choice they are indeed free although they will ask for donations and will usually offer extra episodes for members that's okay he says and you know what um, that is something I have considered doing. There's a thing called Patreon where you can contribute so much per episode. And it can be, you know, as little as, I think it can be like as little as, you know, a quarter per episode or something like that. So, you know, say you wanted to give a dollar per episode and I usually do one episode per month and you could, that means you would be out 12 bucks per for the year. But the way Patreon works is you can cap it out and say, no, I'm I'm willing to give a dollar per episode, but if it goes over 10 episodes, just stop me at 10 bucks. Uh, the thing with Patreon is they always want you to offer some additional content uh, for the members. And I have always had a problem getting out one podcast per month. And I have been considering what I could do about this. Quite honestly, I'm not sure many people would uh, be a patron anyway. Uh, probably wouldn't be worth my time. Uh, I have a hard time getting money out of <laughs> my listeners. <laughs> but anyway, um, I've been considering maybe like doing a quick like five minute podcast and posting that like once per day when I'm out on the road. Wouldn't probably wouldn't do it at home. But uh, if you have any interest in something like that, it would just be a podcast. Like like I said, a little what they call a little mini cast. Uh, just like five minutes per day, only you would get it if you paid for it. And, uh, it would not just be about trucking stuff. It could be just about anything going on. Um, any, any topic I'm thinking about at the time. So I would probably wander way away from trucking at times. Anyway, if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email. I have no plans to do it right now, but if I hear, start hearing from people who would be interested in something like that, then, uh, I might consider it. Anyway, he goes on about podcasts. You can indeed listen to what you want, when you want, from family-friendly to explicit. There are subjects from every possible interest under the sun. Did I mention it's free? (laughs) Yeah, you did, as I did about a million times in that podcast. (laughs) He says, I'm a driver who started out years ago listening to the Truck and Bozo on AMWLW700 out of Cincinnati. I also had no idea what a podcast was. My daughter gave me her old 4 gigabyte iPod Nano and showed me how to get an iTunes account. Also free, by the way. I thought iTunes was for people with green hair and generous amount of facial shrapnel. <laughs> you know, piercings. <laughs> but no, iTunes is for me. I'm more a talk radio guy, and you just go to the podcast section and search for whatever. Sky's the limit. You can be entertained or learn about a topic of interest to you. Yes, I played the tape game with cassettes and even 8-tracks. Remember? (laughs) Yeah, I do remember (laughs) 8-tracks. CDs you have to fumble with going down the road. With your iPod or phone, plug into the radio and use the radio or an FM transmitter, which I use, and that's it. Yeah, you know, I talked about this in my book, Why They're So Much Better. I used to have this big, huge album full of like 250 CDs, and I would be trying to go through that going down the road and that's never safe you know and now it's so easy on an electronic device like a smartphone you can just uh just find it really fast by scrolling or you know with these voice dictation things now you can just basically tell it what you want uh although siri isn't great about getting that right all the time but hey it's an option he says with your phone you can use free wi-fi to download uh your podcasts i use home depot as i deliver there 
I'm cheap. <laughs> so am I. And Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Walmart, Sam's Club, all those, they usually have uh, Wi-Fi back in your truck behind the building. So it works out great. It's not always super fast, but hey, uh, it's free. He says, so yes, driver, check out podcasting on iTunes. You'll find something to interest you, and you won't have to listen to mindless, moronic music anymore. And no, a podcast is not a seafood choice at the buffet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know, I would go one better on you, David. I would say, if you have a smartphone of any kind, or an iPod uh, touch or something like that, I would suggest using a podcast app. It is so much easier than using iTunes. Now, if you have a computer, you can just listen to iTunes, uh, you know, the podcast on iTunes from your computer. But let's be honest, most people are rolling down the road when they're going to want to listen to these things. So uh, my suggestion is just to get a, you know, Apple, the iPhone has the Apple podcast app on it. It's free. And the one I've been suggesting for Android is called Podcast Addict, and it is also free, and you can upgrade uh, to better features if you want, but the free one will do everything you need it to. And that is really super easy because it just downloads directly to your phone, and you don't have to worry about transferring it from your iTunes on your computer or anything. So anyway, get a podcast app. He goes on. He's going to share? Oh, yeah. Okay. He says, uh, I also wanted to mention a new recipe I came up with. If you have a 2,000-watt inverter, a toaster oven, and a Road Pro lunchbox cooker, you can do this. Put your potatoes and veggies of choice into the Road Pro with about a half cup to one cup of water after lining the cooker with foil. That makes it easier to clean. Then get some fresh beef liver at the grocery store. I think Myers has it. And get some shake and bake and use liver in place of chicken. Cook in your toaster oven at 400 degrees for about 40 to 45 minutes on convection bake. Comes out really good and tender. <sighs> okay, here's the problem, David. Liver is freaking gross. <laughs> you know, I liked most of my mom's cooking when I was a kid. But, you know, back in those days, kids didn't get their own individual meals. If they didn't eat what was on the table, they didn't get anything. And I was fine with that. I was like, hey, I'll skip it. You know, but even back then, they were like, eat it. Oh, liver and onions, just the worst. And it wasn't the way my mom made it or anything. I've tried it uh, elsewhere, and it just, oh, it's just gross. Oh, it's all mealy, like in my mouth. Oh, it's just grossing me out as I'm thinking about it. So I will never try this recipe. But, <laughs> hey, uh, you people listening out there, if you like beef liver, give that a shot. I dare you. Okay, now he says... I need to be serious here. Okay, Dave's getting serious. We've all heard the bit about prostate cancer awareness and so on. Blah, blah, blah. That's his words, not mine. Podcast awareness is nothing to blah, blah, blah about. <laughs> he says, well, I always thought that's for the other guy. Well, I became that other guy. I wondered if something was wrong, but put it down to the aging process. Well, I went to the doctor, then to the specialist, and after a few tests, I ended up on the operating table. My PSA was high. Now, after a laparoscopic operation, I don't know if I pronounced that right, it's a minimal invasive procedure, my PSA level is as low as it can be. The test is so finicky that a zero is not attainable, but the surgeon declared me basically cancer-free, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I would be too. <laughs> he says I have to follow up for five years, though. I'm back at work since January 1st at my old job and have actually obtained total bladder control again. Well, congratulations. He says, I'm really happy with that. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> anyway, he says, drivers, get out of the truck and into the doctor and get tested. I'm 58, and as the age increases, so does the risk. Remember, too, those four-wheeling critters that throw you the salute, they're really just worried about your productive health. <laughs> Are they? <laughs> He says, seriously, get tested. My father-in-law died from prostate cancer. Okay, Todd, God bless, and keep your stick on the ice. Roger Beep, Driver Dave. Keep your stick on the ice. Oh, that's a hockey thing. <laughs> I was trying to relate that to trucking somehow. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, you know what? I turned 50 next year, and I had an annual in uh, inspection. <laughs> Is it called an inspection? A uh, checkup. Uh, yeah, doctor. 
And uh, she told me, hey, you're turning 50 next year, so you know what to expect. And I'm like, yep. So I guess it's good that I have a female doctor with really small hands. Dave has already written in a couple of more emails, but I'm going to save those for later on. Thank you, Dave, for writing in. Appreciate it, as always. Next, we're going to jump to driver Chris Mack, which I didn't screw up his name this time, so there will be no bloopers about that. He writes, What I didn't know about Florida, and maybe some of your listeners don't know either, is that I just picked up a load in Jacksonville. This particular shipper has a scale and requires us to be legal before we leave. When I got on the scale, I thought this load was illegal uh, due to the axle weights. And he gives the axle weights of 12,440 on the steer, 30,600 on the drives, and 36,140 on the tra- on the tandem trailer tandems. Now, according to the shipper, I checked my Atlas as well and verifying it with my company. This load is legal since it's only going to Orlando. According to the front of my Atlas, Florida single axle is legal up to 22,000 pounds and 44,000 pounds on the tandems, if that's as long as you aren't over 80,000 pounds gross. Well, thanks for letting me know about this, Chris. I didn't know about this either. It's freaking bizarre. I had no idea that you could be over 34,000. I thought that was like a federal limit, but it's not. If you look in the front of your road atlas, providing you have a road atlas, and we've spoken about that before. Some of you new truckers don't think you need one because you have a GPS, but you do. There's lots of good information in that thing. In the front of it, there is a list of legal weights, and there are a lot of states. I was really surprised. Uh, This actually came in handy for me when I was crossing, uh, I think it was Alabama, has like 36,000 on a tandem axle, and that shocked me. Didn't know that. So I was able to get uh, a load delivered without having to take it back to the shipper. That was really cool. But anyway, 44,000 pounds on a tandem axle in Florida. Uh, of course, you got to be wary, you know, as soon as you cross into Georgia, you're screwed. But, <laughs> you know, it is nice to know that there are uh, uh, some fluctuations, you know. So I've been really good lately after getting this email about checking. You know, before, if I was over 34,000, I would just immediately start adjusting my t- my tandems. And I don't do that anymore. Now I look in the front of that book first, and half the time I look and I go, okay, well, I'm legal, so everything's good. So thanks for letting us know about that, driver Chris Mack. I appreciate it. Hey, and we're going to finish up with Dan. Dan, Dan, Dan is pissed. (laughs) He's very disappointed with truckers. And from reading this, I understand why. I'm not exactly sure which article he read. Uh, I've complained about four-wheelers so often that (laughs) I have no way of knowing. Anyway, he writes, I laughed when I read your article about poopy car drivers, my word, not his, and how truckers are such knights of the highway. Here's the deal. I just did 2,020 miles from Michigan to Alabama and back. Every other truck driver was on his effing cell phone, swerving all over the effing road, can't keep the trailer in his own lay, own lane and side drafts me if he's not trying to pass me going uphill on in Kentucky on I-71. No man, you got that backwards. Yep, tons of poopy car drivers out too, but the percentage of morons tips to the trucker significantly. I even saw one that had sideswiped a highway shoulder broom with more strobe lights than 10 cop cars. <laughs> he says, I get that your audience is truckers, But all I will say about it further is, wow, drive safe, Dan. All right, well, Dan, thanks for writing in. I do appreciate it. And I'm going to read the response that I gave back to him. I said, Dan, I'll have to disagree with you that truckers do this more than car drivers. I have a vantage point you do not since I sit up high. The majority of truckers passing me are not on their phones. Sure, there are some, but most truckers are just cruising down the highway doing their job safely. Cars, however, probably about half the drivers I see are on their phone doing something. To be fair, though, most of these car drivers are not swerving all over the road either. And by the way, I'm not one of those texting Nazis who thinks that humans are not capable of looking down at their phone now and then while driving. We were all doing it with our car stereos long before cell phones even existed. 
The key is you just need to do it when it's appropriate and not in heavy traffic or trying to enter a freeway down an on-ramp. Anyway, Dan, I'm sorry those truckers that you saw gave you a bad impression of the trucking industry. I would, however, urge you to look at the statistics and you'll see that the vast majority of accidents are caused by cars and not trucks. This is by percentage, not total accidents. Last I heard, it was over 80% were caused by cars. And he wrote me back. I guess he didn't expect to be written back. He says, dang, Todd, thanks for the reply. Well, Dan, I reply to everyone, so... <laughs> Maybe I won't one day if I'm super popular, but right now I'm just a little peon. So I got <laughs> plenty of, I always have plenty of time to answer people. Might not be for a couple of months, but I'll answer you eventually. He says, as far as the cars causing accidents thing, I would have a hard time doubting that was not true. Yes, they're terrible. Trust me, I've done a lot of driving and I do mean a lot. I'd say I have 2 million plus miles under the wheels of various vehicles I have owned. Cell phones are a road menace in my opinion. Some people are just not paying enough attention to do both, and every time some ding-dongs started swerving, I'd have my co-pilot, my wife, check them out, and almost without exception, she'd say, Yep, they're playing on their cell phone. And him, GD! <laughs> Only he said the actual word. Um, I'm not going to say that. He says, Everything from letting off the accelerator to straddling the lines. I was hauling a 24-foot boat, so it's not like I can stop on a dime, and that requires extra caution. Seriously, though, I was getting passed on the right by 18-wheelers eight, going 70 in a 55, and I can't count the times I was sandwiched between two of them. Obviously, I will back off a few miles an hour to let them by. It's not a competition to me to get where I'm going. It's just a conveyance to be completed in a safe and sound manner. Too often I said, what's he doing? To no one in particular. <laughs> Oh, Dan, we say that. Truckers say that all the time. What is he doing? What's he thinking? <laughs> anyway, he says, I refuse to drive next to one, and I often speak to them at the truck stops. They're just regular people. I get that, and I don't intend to make it sound like a blanket attack on a driver. The fact remains that some get overconfident in their abilities and or the capability of their equipment. Still, they got my adrenaline pumping more than a few times with various ill-advised antics. Well, yeah, we do that. You know, and what's sad, Dan, is that, you know, as much as truckers complain about car drivers, we are just, as humans, we always tend to focus on the negative. So, you know, we've got thousands of drivers passing us every day, doing nothing wrong, everything's perfect, and then one person does something stupid in front of us, and that's what we dwell on. And according to what you're saying on this particular trip, everyone was, every trucker was doing it. I find that hard to believe, but, you know, either way, I get what you're saying. We tend to focus on the bad and not on the good. But I would urge you to take a look at those good truckers who are doing things right, who are keeping following the distance, who aren't tailgating, who are, you know, being safe drivers and looking out for the morons out there. But you know what? couple other things in this uh, last email got me. You said that you had trucks passing you on the right. My question is, how is that? If you're pulling a trailer, you should probably be in the right-hand lane so a truck can't pass you. If you're in the left-hand lane with the trailer and a truck is going fast enough to pass you, you should probably be in the right lane. Just a suggestion. Um, and that goes for your truck drivers, too, by the way. Uh, anyway... Uh, the part where you said that the fact remains that some get overconfident in their abilities or the capability of their equipment. And you know what? You're exactly right about that. And that is why I have written two articles about complacency uh, in trucking. So uh, we are well aware of that. I'm well aware of it, at least. And I'm trying to raise awareness among uh, my listeners. So let's hope that happens. Uh, usually something bad has to happen before we start paying attention again, which is sad. I think once again, that's just human nature. But anyway, Dan, I appreciate you writing in. I always like to get the thoughts of some people outside the trucking industry. Usually they're not very happy at the time when I get these emails, but that's all right. <laughs> I'll live. I do appreciate it though, Dan. Well, finally, that will about do it for this episode. I'd like to thank Goat Bob, Driver Dave, Driver Chris Mack, and Dan for writing in. I'd like to thank Trucker Bob for doing the Trucker Grub section. And 
I would love to get more feedback. I'm getting a little low on it. Uh, of course, I would love to have some audio comments. That would be awesome. You can record those directly into your phone. If you have a smartphone, just pull up your voice memo app, record what you want to say, hopefully when you're stopped, and for two reasons, because it's safer and because it will sound a lot better, and just shoot it off to truckerdump at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on anything you have suggestions, comments, uh, tips for other drivers, anything like that. I would love to hear it on past episodes or this current one. Whatever you are willing to do, I am willing to take. Once again, I'd like to thank our two sponsors for sponsoring this episode of Trucker Dump. Citadel Fleet Safety at citadelfleet.com and Classic Truck Insurance at classictruckinsurance.com slash truckerdump. Crank it to 11. So, hey, do you have some tips to be a more efficient trucker? Share your thoughts by going to abouttruckdriving.com and searching for TD129. Or shoot me an email at truckerdump at gmail.com. You can also join the Trucker Dump Slack group with that email. Twitter has become a steaming pile of hate, but I'm still there as at Todd McCann. That's two D's, two C's, and two N's. If you're on Facebook and haven't joined us over there, search for Trucker Dump Podcast or click the link in the show notes. And be sure to check out the books at abouttruckdriving.com or anywhere you buy ebooks. And please consider leaving a review wherever you get the podcast. Thanks for listening and subscribing. So until next time, drive safe and stay out of my way. I thought I thought iTunes was for people with green hair and a generous amount of facial sharp. I thought I thought iTunes was for people with green hair and a generous or I thought iTunes was for people with generous said give us would you mind give us an given Wow, that's easy for me to say. Ugh. First off, I'd like to First off, I'd like to uh, good lord. First off, I'd like to co- compliment. I don't want to compliment you. Although you're nice people, I'm sure. And uh, the one I've been suggesting for Android, Android, Android is called. Still got three more stories. Hope you're all buckled in. But hey, this is about driver pay. pay. Mm, driver P. Now I don't keep stats on this sort of thing, but if I had to guess, I'd say I'm calling or messaging. Easy for me to say. Now, I don't keep stats on this sort of thing, but if I had to guess, I would say I'm calling or messaging my... Good Lord. Messaging. Why is that so hard to say? Now, I don't keep stats on this sort of thing, but if I had to guess, I'd say I'm calling or dispatching my con... Dispatching my contact? What am I saying? Yeah. Anyway, they're saying they will also be able to maybe even do like payroll on this thing which is pretty cool no they didn't say that they didn't say anything about payroll what am i saying what am i talking about <sighs> clueless as always check one check two check three check four check 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 popping in the microphone pop 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 popping in the microphone